Hello, this is Dr. Christy Patton Lokes. In this lesson, we're going to be looking at another energy balance example and really start trying to think about where this data is going to come from so that we can complete these balances. We're going to be looking very specifically at balances on non-reactive processes in this chapter. For chemical engineering, um, most of the problems that we will be solving are going to have very negligible changes to potential energy or kinetic energy. So typically I'm going to write the energy balance without those terms. There will be instances where you need to include them. And you can always go back and add them in, but just for less clutter and to make the problems not seem as overwhelming. Now for a steady state system, this is an open system with flow, my energy balance without kinetic and potential energy changes is that I'm going to look at the sum of all the enthalpies coming out minus the sum of all the enthalpies coming in. So if I have multiple streams, it's the mass flow rates of the various streams times the specific enthalpy of each of those streams on the outlet side and on the inlet side. So that difference is going to equal the energy transfer from the system to the surroundings, Q plus W. If I have a closed system, then I look at the internal energy change with time. And again, this is going to equal Q plus W, how energy is transferred between the system and the surroundings. Now what's going to happen, there's, it can be hard to find Q and W. I'm not going to kid you on that, but for our purposes right now, Q and W will frequently either be given or we will be trying to solve for those using these energy balances. But H and U, we're going to be expected to know those. And so we're going to find that the hardest part of solving most problems will be finding values of H and U. So first, I want you to keep in mind that enthalpy is defined by U plus PV. So this is a definition. P and V are physical measurements, right? We know how to measure pressure, and I can certainly measure volume or even specific volume because I can divide by mass. But the H and the U part are not quite so well defined. And, you know, U equal to zero doesn't even really necessarily mean anything in particular. The zero point is selected arbitrarily. We just call it a reference state. And it varies from book to book, data table to data table. All the other numbers in that table will be defined as a change from that reference state. So it would have more energy or less energy. Not that there is a particular amount of energy, just that there's this much more energy than at the reference state. So the data tables in our book use the triple point of water as their reference state. And these are some of the sections of these tables that we can look at. And you can find similar kinds of things uh, for other substances. Um, th and they exist. You can look them for them in data books. Thermodynamic textbooks frequently have this data. You can find it online. You can find this sort of data many, many places, but it tends to be for only the most common pure substances. We're going to do another example. In this particular case, we're going to heat water isobarically in a steady flow heater from saturated liquid water at one bar to steam at 250 degrees C. If no work is performed, how much heat would be required to heat 50 kilograms per second of water? So, okay, let's just go through this kind of word by word. So, water is heated, so this tells me that Q is not going to be zero. It's heated isobarically, so same bars, that means pressure. So the pressure is constant. Okay, so 
Q is not going to be zero. The pressure is going to be constant. We're talking about water. It's a steady flow heater. Okay, so means I'm going to have flow coming in and out with no accumulation. All right, and it says then, therefore, my balance is going to be this delta H plus delta kinetic energy plus delta potential energy is equal to Q plus W. Okay, it's going to go from saturated liquid at one bar, so it's water, it's going to be a saturated liquid, the pressure is one bar, to steam at 250 degrees C, so it's going to be H2O, it's going to be a vapor, it's going to be 250 degrees C. We say no work is performed. That means I can cross the W out. How much heat will be required to heat 50 kilograms per second of water? Okay, so I've now reinterpreted this problem statement in terms of a drawing. And I can clean that up perhaps. I'm going to have 50 kilograms per second coming out as well as in. It's going to be pressure of one bar coming in as well as out because the pressure is constant. We know work is going to be zero and we know Q is not going to be zero. I know that the exit temperature is going to be 250 degrees C, and this is going to be a saturated liquid, which will define the temperature. I know if I look at my first law, or my energy balance, W is zero, I'm going to assume that kinetic and potential energy are also zero. And so I'm left with Q is equal to delta H. All right, so Q is equal to delta H. Delta H in this case is going to be the enthalpy out minus the enthalpy in. And I need to uh, find mass flow rates, which I know, right? This is going to be my mass flow rate, both in and out. I need to find the enthalpies. And then that will allow me to find Q. So where am I going to find those? Well, it turns out on the superheated steam table, this data is available. So I have a pressure of one bar. So pressure is one bar. Tells me that the saturation temperature is 99.6. So that says that the temperature that's coming in is 99.6 degrees C. It tells me that for saturated liquid water, the enthalpy is 417.5 and at this pressure and a temperature of 250, the enthalpy is 2975. So now I just need to plug these numbers in. My units, kilograms cancel, I'm left with kilojoules per second. If I wish then this would be equivalent to 1,207 1,875 kilowatts, but it's more convenient to go ahead and use my SI prefixes, and therefore the answer is 128 megawatts.